Hi. So we are talking today to the German political expert, Sergei Sumlyanny, uh, who lives in Berlin and is the head of the European Resilience Initiative Center. Sumlyanny holds a PhD in political science and LLM in European law. And as you have probably guessed already, we are talking about Germany, um, its politics, its weird position on Russia, Merkel, uh, European security and everything related to that. Hi, Sergey. Hi, great to see you. Thank you for having invited me today. It looks that we see some sort of uh, tectonic shift in the German politics. And we know that now Germany uh, provides Ukraine with a lot of high-tech uh, weapons, like starting from RST, air defense systems, and ending with Leopard 2 tanks and all bunch of other equipment is being uh, provided like the mobile uh, devices for laying bridges like the all the leopard one tanks uh, patriot uh, missile systems from germany has also been provided i don't count like all sort of like um, firearms machine guns ammunition uh, medical kits and 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 uh, but that is what uh, you're right that is what we are observing now and uh, if we look back to like uh, February 22 or even earlier, like to January 22, before the full scale invasion, Germany was quite different. And Germany was uh, totally like reluctant uh, and uh, unwilling to provide Ukraine with anything. We all remember this story, which looked to be like from some sort of bad comedy show about 5,000 German helmets, which Germany like offered to Ukraine, but then did not deliver. Because, according to the German side, uh, the Ukrainians did not feel uh, on a proper way like the, uh, the the paperwork and didn't provide it, uh, Germans with a zip code where these helmets should be sent. Like that was uh, like some sort of like uh, from a bad, really from from a, like Kafka book, uh, some sort of like parody. Uh, thanks God, it changed now. And like three quarters of the Germans uh, support providing uh, Ukraine with weapons. But back then, and a month after, even month after uh, the German Bundeschancel Scholz, uh, like proclaimed this so called Zeitenwende or a historical change, the change of age of epochs, um, effectively, like nothing happened until, let me say, October last year, when Germany really started to provide Ukraine with weapons. And here we can ask a question. Why were the Germans blind on the Ukrainian eye? Why they were concentrated on the Russia's interests? Why they were mocking the Ukrainians all the time, like saying, no, you have like terrible nationalists in your army and you were all like, you are corrupt. We may not provide you with the weapons as if there is like no nationalists in Russia and no corruption in Russia. But the, 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 the difference is, like Russia prepared a genocidal war and Russia openly talked about that and Russia didn't hide it like like it is really crazy because the Russians never hit their plans they said it openly they said openly what they want to do with Ukraine it was enough to watch the Russian TV shows on the state TV to understand they want to kill Ukrainians they want to raise the Ukrainian state and if you listen to to, to the press conference of Vladimir Putin when the French President Macron visited Moscow, then Putin, on the final statement, he he made a rape joke addressing Ukraine. Like he quoted uh, th that 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 famous in Russia famous uh, punk uh, song with the words about like how uh, how a person rapes uh, uh, rapes a sleeping woman Oops. and tells her uh, you like it or not you will have you will have to endure through this, and it. And then he added, Putin added, uh, yeah, so Ukraine just needs to fulfill its obligations. It was clear that it was about a total destruction of everything and about violating of all rules. And the West didn't want to see that, except that the countries like the UK, the US and Poland and Germany was among them who willingly ignored this danger. Before we go next, uh, you know, in our shows, we don't do this Mentis and Coke experiments, which make youtubers popular and uh we might consider doing that though but before we did that uh please consider liking and subscribing to our content uh leaving a comment below what do you think about all this germany thing right uh and also donate us money you you can subscribe via youtube or patreon or buy me a coffee there will be a link in the end 
of the video watch watch the video till the end it's really really good um thank you well, i just have like was it some sort of like try like I i'm just wondering whether it's like political corruption or uh like this psychological state where you're like trying to pretend that something horrible isn't going to happen like i, I guess it's partially both but i'm just trying to understand the reason why with everything being so out in the open and everything being so obvious and history basically repeating itself for the hundredth time how how did it come to be why why did the, the most powerful european country kind of decided to close their eyes for a bit uh, around the time well i think as in every uh, dramatically massive uh, political process. There is no one single reason which explains everything. And in this case, it was uh, like a harmony, like a, a synchronization of many very different uh, factors. Uh, some of them uh, appeared not yesterday, and even not this century, but like centuries ago. Uh, like we can, um, like there were historical, historical, uh, like connections between Germany and uh, Russian Empire, with many Germans who were looking, who were seeking for like their luck in Russia and got to Russia as like settlers and got incredible chances for career. Like Russia was always seen by the Germans as the country of endless opportunities. Like you cannot be successful at home, but you can be successful in Russia. And uh, that tradition continued, like in uh, the Soviet time, the Germans came to uh, to Russia, like with their technologies, like Siemens continued to work there uh, under the Tsars and uh, after the Tsars. And if you look at the like relations between Russia and Germany in 1990s, you will find like incredible stories of German success in Russia. Like who is one of the most successful, uh, like Russian agriculture, uh, agriculture uh, entrepreneurs? Uh, it is a German uh, citizen, Stefan Dürer, and Stefan Dürer came to the Soviet Union in, in 1989, I believe, as a student of agricultural faculty from Bavaria. He came to some kolkhoz, to some Soviet collective farm close to Moscow and understood that uh, he can he can really revolt this this thing and he can got attention and respect and power he never could get in germany and he developed within like 20 30 years he developed into one of the biggest russian agricultural tycoons and he got what he didn't get in germany he got political influence he got direct access to Vladimir Putin. He was the person who introduced uh, the Russian sanctions against the European agricultural producers for his own good, of course, because he was agricultural pro pro uh, uh, like a producer in Russia, but also to fulfill this feeling, like to uh, to have this feeling, I am influential, I am an advisor of President Putin, of uh, like world leader with nuclear bomb, and I am a poor German student who came to Russia and developed to an important person. I am now important. I am now doing the world policy. But not only that, like you can also see the, uh, the German colonial approach to the countries of Central and Eastern Europe. Like Germany has never questioned its colonial past. Like the British Empire uh, and the Brits had a uh, deep decolonization process and investigation of what we did in the past is it good or is it bad? Uh, the US Americans, uh, they had all these debates and have it until now. Germany had their colonies in Africa and uh, like killed a lot of Herero people. It was a real genocide. This topic started to appear in some media just within the last 10 years. It was an absolutely blind spot. And what the Germans did with the countries of Central and Eastern Europe, it was never a topic. Like until now, some German media accused Poland of uh, the start of the World War II. Like just imagine it, 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 oh, it is weird. But you can see in German media who are, they, yeah, they, they are like a bit radical and they are not mainstream, but they exist on the, on the legal, on the legal, um, like on the legal space in the legal room and they say yeah poland provoked world war ii because they were too aggressive and from this 
What? <laughs> I've never. I'm sorry. I've never heard like, anything like is, it. Okay, then you. Like, then, then even, you just, even even on Elon Musk's Twitter, it's it's too it's too extreme. Too radical. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's like, extreme for it Elon. Was Musk. Like um, a couple of months ago, there was a special issue of the German uh, magazine Compact, and they dedicated the whole magazine and uh, the whole issue and um, a lot of video podcasts to this like terrible Poland which like provoked World War II and then like... Uh, yeah, yeah, because uh, you, you remember that uh, incident. I mean, <laughs> you mean Glavitz? Uh, yeah, Glavitz. Glavitz, yeah, Glavitz. Glavitz, 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 that it was like something which bought it. Of course, they don't. It. Also, because like it's uh, it's legally it's legally it, it, it's legally impossible in Germany. But it is. I mean, but it I'm, is possible. Oh my god, this is just too good. This is too good. <laughs> I just can't. I can't. My brain froze for a second. I haven't been able to compose myself ever since. I'm sorry. Is it like yeah? Is it is it like ignorance? Um, or I, I don't know a how... Russian Russian influence. No, no, no. I, I I don't think we need Russians for that. Like this is uh, this is pure <laughs> German uh, thing. Like we like we can do it on our own, really. Um, I think it is about like um, sharing responsibility and uh, trying to get rid of the of the guilt. Do you think that um, so this um, one hundred eighty? Um, uh, w- w- 180 of Scholz, uh, Zeiten, sorry, Zeitenwende. I the name, Zeitenwende, uh, is the, um, is related to its, to, to the German change of its relation with Eastern Europe and, um, to like the, the cancellation or like at least the, some, at some point, the cancellation of Ostpolitik or something like that. Or is it just the, situational uh, decisions because America pressures, Europe pressures, Ukraine pressures, and you can you cannot just do other things. I would say that um, Germany is a country which did not want to see any structural changes in the region. Like uh, for Germany, the uh, emerging of Poland as a strong player was already a problem. And it is also like, uh, I, I just want to shortly uh, give an impression of that. Like our trade with Poland is uh, three times bigger than our turnover with Russia before the full scale invasion. Oh, wow. Yes. And if you count it uh, per capita, uh, you will see it is like 10 times more than with Russia before the full scale invasion. Now the gap is even bigger. But uh, every political discussion before the full-scale invasion about, like, should we sanction Russia, should we pressure Russia politically, economically, ended with the argument, first, Russia is our neighbor. It's not true. Look at the geographical map. Russia is not your neighbor. Your neighbor is yeah. Poland and Czechia it's... and Austria and then Ukraine and Belarus. No and only then it's it Russia. Is your, no. it, is, it is your neighbor if you think of uh, Eastern Europe as part of your Exactly, exactly. So mentally, mentally, it existed the same like border between the German Reich and the Russian Empire. Aye, 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 aye. Sounds aye. bad. Sounds yeah. very... Um... And secondly, Russia is not that important for you that you could not cancel it. But nobody, nobody addressed uh, political tensions between Berlin and Poland from the perspective we may not like uh, pressure Poland because Poland is our neighbor, which is true, and Poland is so economically important, which is also true. So Poland could just be ignored because who cares? But Russia enjoyed that uh, image of a great power of a country of endless resources, of endless trade, endless opportunity, etc. And plus, Russia totally appropriated the uh, German responsibility towards the Central and Eastern Europe. When uh, two weeks before the full-scale invasion, the German President Steinmeier gave interview uh, to the German um, to a German newspaper Rheinische Post, he said Germany may not cancel Nord Stream two pipeline project 
because it is the last bridge which connects us to Russia, and that is our way to repay the debts for the Second World War. But who protested against Nord Stream 2? It were Ukraine, it were Poland, two countries who suffered much more from the World War II than Russia did. So in the world of uh, President Steinmeier, and he's the head of the German state, there was only guilt towards Russia and the guilt towards Poland, like Warsaw Ghetto, Warsaw Uprising, uh, like uh, uh, killing off uh, Polish intelligentsia, and, 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 and the debt towards Ukraine, they just didn't exist, just the, just the debt towards, towards uh, Russia. So now if you look from this point of view into relations between Germany and Russia, without like Poland, uh, Ukraine, Czechia and other countries, you see like there is like there are a lot of, of factors for that. It is political colonialism. It is also, of course, like certain economic interests because of course, like the overall turnover with Russia was not that big, but some companies made fortunes in Russia. And it is like some sort of, yeah, systemic corruption. Because like, this is, yeah, this is what I was gonna like, because you s kind of fluently went into the topic of Nord Stream 2. And that was kind of, whenever, I mean, I, I have a long personal story with Nord Stream 2. Um, I just never could wrap my head around the fact, just like, why? 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 Yeah, I mean, I get why in the sense of like, um, convenience or, or price or whatnot. But that was so, uh, plainly and blatantly obvious to everyone that this was going to be a part in, in putting pressure in Europe and in, uh, you know, advancing Russian geopolitics and which are hostile and, and whatnot. Even to but Trump. Even to Trump. Yeah. Which is hilarious. But I always wondered, is that what the thing we've been talking about, this innate kind of I don't want to call it Russophilia, but like innate comfort and innate kind of willing for this relationship with Russia, or is it partially, sorry, uh, yeah, Entschuldigung, but corruption? And I could never, because there, in this day and age, especially in terms of natural resources, there are all, all sorts of ways to kind of make sure that your geopolitics and that your influence remain untouched and safe without having to, you know, buy R Russian Russian resources. And everybody knows Russia is a hostile country and that kind of international kind of trade should be avoided. And, you know, there are possibilities. I just never understood who thought this could be a great idea and why did nobody see it coming except for like, yes, Poles, Ukrainians and a bunch of other states who, who know what Russia well, is. Well, you have brilliantly described uh, like this paradox. Uh, it is indeed a mixture of uh, Russophilia, uh, political corruption and uh, blindness, like good intended blindness. I would like shortly describe the last one for Germany. It was always hard to imagine because the Germans always said economy over politics and always said like, uh, said the, the trade over, let me say, military pressure or something like that. Because we have tried like several times to, um, like to, to make things militarily, like to reach our goals militarily and we utterly failed. So it was like clearly like yeah, a no go no, area, never good, again, no. because like um, it will it will end in a disaster, and that's why also the Germans like uh, don't understand pretty well why do Ukrainians so much oppose the occupation? Like Germany was defeated and occupied, so what? Like we're still the the most important European power. Like never was a big problem for us. So that was uh, like the German way to see the things like uh, we do trade, uh, we make deals, so we suffer occupation when needed, but after all, it's all good because our technology, because our, our like skilled workers, because our Elfindergeist, um, like inventor's spirit. And uh, from this perspective, uh, you don't make wars against those with whom you trade. If you can extract profit from trade, why do it with military means? So from that perspective, they never believed that Putin will attack Ukraine. I think that most of Germans expect, like if you exclude like some really crazy, bad, bad, bad things who villainly acted as uh, Putin's agents, most Germans never believed that Russia would attack because you just don't do it. Like the German official assessment uh, of the German military 
uh, before the Crimea annexation or occupation was Russia would never do it because this would be a violation of international law. And Russia has not signed into international law uh, to violate it. So that's why Russia will never do it. Like, it sounds crazy, but that was the German oh, way to think. Georgia. It sounds, it sounds, uh, it sounds like it's almost, I don't know, I could, if somebody asked me for a reason why I do something stupid, I would have come up with some better, better reason, like, just, you know, but this just sounds like, I don't know, is everybody stupid? It stupid but it was like the way how to think, like, like, you don't like build a multi-million pipeline just to not use it. Like, if you build it, you will use it, uh, uh, and, uh, like, it, it, it's uh, obvious. Like what the Germans didn't understand that Putin never plays uh, even like that Putin never plays positive sum game, but he also do not like a zero sum games. He would better play a negative sum game. Like if he if he if he sees like two outcomes in the first outcome, Putin gets or Russia gets like minus one, and the uh, opponent gets like minus three. And in the another another game, uh, Russia gets like minus five, but the opponent gets like minus twenty. He would prefer the, the second one, despite of the fact that Russia loses much more than in the first game. Like minus five is worse than minus one, but the gap between Russia and the opponent is much bigger. That means for the next iteration of the game. Russia has much more leverage against the opponent. That was absolutely not clear for the Germans. And now we come to like some sort of political influence and economic influence. Look what Russia did during the last years in Germany, particularly. It was not only like inviting people to some conferences, provided them like with hot rooms, with like wines and tours and some like um, other services. It was much worse. It was. Uh, installing Russian influence into Germany's most unsuccessful regions. If you look at the uh, federal region mecklenburg vorpommern it is on the uh, northeast of Germany, bordered to Poland and Baltic Sea uh, coast. It is where, where North, North Stream 2 comes. Exactly, yep. exactly. What the Russians did during the last like 10 years of, no, uh, 15 years, they looked for companies which went bankrupt and bought them and the investments were like uh, it, it wasn't much money uh, to buy and to maintain but effectively you you don't only come as a saver to a city which otherwise would suffer of a huge unemployment you also start to control the city because any time if there are like uh, tensions between Russia and Germany you always may threat and say i will pull back and you will have in your city a lot of unemployment you look at Wismar, a uh, port facility in uh, on the baltic sea the russians control the uh, a huge shipyard and um and a wood uh, pre uh, wood processing factory two key industry uh, industry units in a city of like 40,000 people, but one of the biggest cities in that region. If Russians just pull out two investments, and the first one investment is the son of a former Gazprom uh, board director, and the second company is owned by a company which is directly related to, to uh, Dmitry Medvedev, the former Russian president. Absolutely politically, uh, politically colored investment. And if they pull out, you will have unemployment in the city, you will have problems in the region, you will have lost elections, and as a German federal uh, region, you have influence to foreign policy through the uh, chamber of the region. Uh, in a company which produced uh, which produced uh, buses in uh, Thuringia, I believe they even tried to buy Opel. Like it was two thousand nine, and um, after the world economic crisis, uh, General Motors had problems, and they wanted to sell Opel because Opel uh, was a purely European company. They could not sell cars outside of, of, of Europe. And then Sberbank, the Russian state-owned bank, came there with German Graf as the CEO, and they said, we buy Opel. 
Uh, Sberbank had ne never had any experience with car production, but they wanted to buy Opel and the deal was almost signed. And I remember how German Graf, the CEO of Sberbank, came to the Frankfurt car exhibition uh, in 2009. And he said in the first row as tomorrow owner of Opel, like one of the most important persons in Germany, and only a huge bailout for General Motors helped to prevent this deal. Now imagine if Russia would have controlled 100,000 of jobs in Germany just with Opel and could pressure the Germans any time and say, you want 100,000 unemployed in your, in your cities? You want the Rosenheim? Like 20,000 jobs, like close to Frankfurt, a very poor city, like very dependent on Opel, that the, that the city gets to economic ruin? If we pull our money back, you don't want to, you don't want to have a conflict with Russia. That was the Russia's plan, and it mostly worked. You, you say things like that. Um, when you say they, they sound normal, but if you think about it, it sounds totally crazy. Russia, bought, Mark, Mark, yeah. Mark. I'm like terrified right now. Yeah, <laughs> this yeah, is yeah. the I'm first sorry time on the podcast. No, it's okay. Yeah, no, it's, it's just like I'm sitting there because I think I know something, right? I also like me, Mark here. We talk about all sorts of crap all the time. And then we think we know something. And then we talk to a person like you. And I'm like, oh, my God, I feel just, real bad. Like, for, for our viewers who like... If you don't know what Russia is, it's, it, it has never been like normal Russia and then it became like bad Russia or something like that. It always was evil, uh, evil Russia, which massacres people, which uh, commits genocides and all always, the stuff. All the time, all the time, all the time. Opponents, journalists. All the time. Like all the money made in Russia, like all the all these billions and billions of dollars are blood money. They are made of blood. And uh and the major European country, and it's not just like, I don't know, Slovakia or something like that, you know, and yeah, yeah, yeah we, we bought Slovakia. It's not like Slovakia. It's, it's a Germany. It's not, it, I mean, yeah, I think, I think it is, uh, like I think it's not a matter like of that. size. I think for Russia, it is much more complicated to, let me say, buy Estonia than to buy Germany. Yeah, yeah, no, exactly. It's ideological, I think, also. It's like, um, but it, it, and it's, it's a not, thing. And it's not like, you know, China buying uh, plants in the United States. It's like, I don't know, um, I don't know, Iran uh, buying the United States. <laughs> this, is, this is the scales over here. Uh, well, so so I, like, I like you know, a, like, yeah, so regarding a, yeah. to that, uh, the, the German economic relations to Russia uh, was always based on the principle of Wandel durch Handel, or the change through trade. The idea was we trade with them, we visit them, we influence them, we introduce them to our like rules and processes, and uh, they will change. And then German said, oh, mm, Wandel durch Handel didn't work. No! No, stupid. It worked. It just worked in another direction. It just worked <laughs> in another direction. There was wonder, there was a change, but the change was on our, on our end. And it is, it is absolutely clear because um, you may not change a dictatorship, authoritarian dictatorship, without rule of law, without freedom of, freedom of economy, with trade. Because if you have trade, indeed, any trade produces dependencies. But these are interdependencies of economic character. And autocracies and dictatorships overcome economic losses way more easy on a short-term perspective than democracies. That's why autocracies and dictatorships provoke and trigger economic tensions, because they know that in the short term they will win this fight. And democracies normally don't have like a guts to get into a long-term conflict like for example the collective west decided in 70s they need or 80s they need to defeat the ussr and the ussr had no chances but in a short-term perspective the autocracies always win because we are dependent on our short-term pulse so i'm of a firm belief that uh, after the 22nd of february 2022 um uh, it was it was largely the democracy that saved Ukraine, meaning that people actually, you know, saw what was happening in Ukraine, felt, you know, compassionate and pressured their politicians and their governments into actions. Because I don't know whether that would be so much help for Ukraine if it wasn't for the, you know, European public. Absolutely. Yeah, but I just was wondering, 
the what's the opinion uh what was and what is the opinion of the, of the german public of of actual russians because now we know now what what that there's been a difference between their treatment like, and then their thoughts about ukraine and ukrainians from not knowing and not caring to like deeply compassionate to you know all these refugees that germany has hosted and whatnot um and also humanitarian causes obviously too but what has has there been a change in 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 treatment and in a um kind of percept you know you know perception of russia and russia well uh definitely in perception of russia um i doubt in perception of the russians uh like uh, the perception of russia has dramatically changed and i do not believe that there will be a significant rollback like what uh, russia did in ukraine uh it, it it was a real shock for the most of the germans like nobody could imagine that uh okay i know we told them so that will be but they they just couldn't believe but when it happened like everyone was shocked and i don't think that this shock will sometimes like in the foreseeable future will disappear uh regarding the russians um most germans do not believe that uh this war is the war of the russians uh this war from the german perspective is uh the putin's war and of course there are like some bad people around of putin and some sadists in the army but they are all isolated cases and the idea that the russian uh people that the population that like 60 years old uh, women or like 80 years old grandfathers uh, gladly support this war and say they would happily eliminate the ukrainian nation and then poles and the others and of course the jews are the worst uh and the americans and the germans and the balts like everyone must be nuked and russia should gloriously rule from lisbon to vladivostok this is unimaginable for them like they just they just don't don't they they cannot imagine it like because it is like some sort of you cannot understand the logic of an alien like you have amazing movies about that like uh, their rival like how can you translate an alien language and if you can start to speak an alien language then you start to see the future because it changed your mind uh so to understand the russian way of thinking the russian glorification of terror the russian glorification of brutality is like to learn a language of an alien for most germans because that is what the german nation tried to eradicate in itself for three generations like uh the 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 brutality of the nazis was the thing uh, was the 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 uh, um characteristic was the skill uh which the german nation repeatedly decade for decade uh amputated uh, out of like uh, this this number of skills because we knew what happens when you let this this tumor to grow and we we removed this tumor and now you want to understand this tumor again that like, that is like that, that, that's impossible and uh, that's why for example i had a, a great talk recently with uh, with one of uh, central asian scholars and she told me uh, she was really shocked when she compared the number of uh, high paid and influential scholarship positions which the russian scholars got in the west and compared it to the number of positions similar positions which the ukrainians got and it is like two worlds like the russians get practically everything they just come to the west the western university and say we are here we are suffering we have been expelled from moscow university we need a similar job and they get a job they don't need even to apply they don't need to go through the application process they just like send an email and they are in and the ukrainian scholars who like uh, suffer from from trauma who uh, lost their house because their library their working place their friends because it, their house had been bombed out who like escaped to 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 Europe who cannot hear the loud sounds because it triggers them who need to find like some job here who who have to write this application in the evening between taking care of their kid 
and like uh, reading news from Ukraine and uh, making contacts with their Ukrainian friends who are still under the bombs. These Ukrainian scholars don't get anything. Also because the Germans are not only Germans, and here I want to blame explicitly the Americans with their universities and the Brits with their universities, because they do it not less than the Germans and maybe more than the Germans. And these people... We have just know. discussed it on our last podcast how Russians have basically embedded themselves into the system of Slavic studies and virtually just occupy the entire field where there are no other voices but Russian voices. And yes, the US and Brits and, and, and Europeans are kind of largely... Uh, yeah, I'm guilty of that because that that actually helps to instill this like very soft influence. Um, I remember I studied in Germany in Freiburg for uh, a couple of years, and I did have a serious issue of you know Slavic department because it was just a Russian department. That's what it was. It was not. I was like, why do you call it Slavic? It's it's not really. I think I think things have changed now there. But yeah, it's 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 very dangerous because it's not obvious. It's sometimes very absolutely and. Uh uh, as the next iteration, what happens? Even if these people, even if they are anti-Putin, they don't know Ukraine, they don't have a value of independent Ukraine, they cannot understand why the Ukrainians want to get rid of Russia, because they believe that the Russian culture itself is a value, and why do these stupid Ukrainians want to deprive themselves of the great Russian culture, they would just like profit from being a part of the great Russian cultural space, they start to write the policy papers. They start to advise the Western politicians what to do yeah. towards Ukraine. And these advices are not only non-Ukrainian, they often contradict the Ukrainian interest. And when the Ukrainians raise their voice, they are easily being like silenced as uh, emotional, biased, stressed, like not capable to see the broader picture, narrow-minded, or like even worse, like uh, misogynistic uh, things come like hysterical, like and, 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 and. So this is the real problem. And um, like most, like look, where were most Western media based who reported from Ukraine? In Germany, it were Moscow offices. Moscow. Same for America. If Same you, for uh, virtually every big, yeah. You, against Putin, and even if you're pro-Ukrainian, you get your whole information from your Moscow friend circle and from Moscow media. You come to Ukraine only like when something happens for one week, for two days, you report from there, you come back to your comfortable Moscow milieu. And uh, even worse, like, look, there was like another like under undocumented consequence of this uh, case. When you have no political breaking news around, you still need to report something. And as a journalist, you look for like human stories, like some old lady working as a post office, uh, like employee in province or some kitchen, like some cuisine stories or some culture, some music, some religion topics, etc. And you yeah, and so you promote you can Russian produce it culture. in Russia. So Russia okay. got yeah. its human side being presented in the West. But Ukraine was reported only when you had crisis and you have gas war with Russia or Maidan or some uh, political crisis or now the war. So in the eyes yeah, of the there, there was, yeah, yeah, Sorry, uh, uh, there was a joke and I remembered it from probably 2016 or something uh, from the Colbert show, the late night, late night show uh, on CBS, I guess. Uh, and there was a joke uh, because he had to read the news about Ukraine and, his, and here's the news from Ukraine. You know, the news from Ukraine are like the news from your old, very old granny. Those are always like bad. Uh, and, Absolutely. And, uh, and th th that's how it was in the West all the Absolutely. time. Absolutely. Still. Mark, we had a meme. We had a meme within our community of Ukrainians, there's a Twitter community, that, you know, whatever Russia does, like some horrible, horrible stuff, horrible crimes, somebody got murdered, somebody got, you know, laws were being broken, Russian law has been virtually non-existent, but there's always this one or two news outlets who will record a video on this Russian babushka who's ice skating yeah, somewhere yeah, 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 in, yeah. Uh, in Kamchatka. And then look at her, this sweet babushka. Who's How can this country be skating. evil when they have like yeah, such yeah, beautiful yeah. nature? <laughs> and that was like exactly, exactly, exactly what the Russians wanted to have. That's why the Russian TASS uh, news agency entered into a strategic partnership with the uh, Thomson Reuters. 
because they started yes, they started true. to feed Thomson Reuters with this uh, senseless, like meaningless videos of like, mm-hmm. look what cute baby bear was born in Khabarovsk in Khabarovsk Zoo. Oh, look, uh, they they continued doing it uh, during the invasion, during like yeah, the yeah, Bucha yeah. and all this stuff. Reuters continued doing. It. I think until very recently, uh, I haven't seen for a while, but yeah. Crazy. Uh, it's just yeah. Okay, we've um, been talking about this. Yeah, Mark, come on. I, I, let's I wanted, go to our to most talk, important. I wanted, I wanted to talk about Merkel, but I'm not sure if uh, if it fits. We we talked about like the 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 reasons. No, Do you want on. to talk, about, talk Merkel about Merkel in the in this like uh, pattern of the Russian news about Khabarovsk Zoo being born? Because like <laughs> Merkel has turned uh, currently into like a person who suddenly appears like once a half a year with some weird statement and then disappears. Yeah. Yeah, she was uh, she was a like really popular and really uh, I guess strong leader. Uh, she was uh, in power for a very long time, and uh, she did probably great job in some parts of German economy, etc. But her relationship with Russia is out like uh, suspicious. I would say. I, I mean, you cannot explain her um, like um, her relationship with Putin. Um, like without like uh, all the decisions she made in terms of Russia, in terms of Ukraine, Minsk, and then uh, all the things she's saying now during the 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 uh, full scale invasion, uh, you, you cannot resist like sus- suspecting yeah, stuff. It's, Although it's, it's weird. not, yeah, it's, it's, it's probably not. It's just some personal thing of hers. But uh, it's just weird. All the all the all all the things we heard about Merkel and her. Russia relationship. Yeah, it's it's just it's it's so contrasting. It's like she is a st- strong European leader with all these values, and she supports Ukraine unequivocally. But then they do all these things with like you know t- you know trade uh, difficulties with sanctions, non uh, you know supplying Ukraine with weapons, and then Crimea, and then you know she meets. Before that, she meets Putin, and there's this whole uh, shebang with the story of how she hates dogs, and Putin brings in the dog, and then. Her actions kind of contradict what she says. It's it's just it's so difficult to because she does not seem. I have to say this, and a lot of people will be disappointed. I do not imagine or see her as like this spineless weakling. Like she she makes it look like as if she knows what she's doing. So Absolutely, it's yeah. even more schizophrenic for me. I liked her. And why? Yeah, I liked her too so much before the before the war. I did. I did. And and later with and I always found excuses for her. I tried to. I was young and I was I didn't know better any better. I was like second year university. I was like, oh my god, she's like the leader of the free world or everything. It was so cool. I mean, I said the same thing about Obama. I don't know. I'm sorry. Yeah. I was young yeah, yeah. and impressionable. But what what the hell happened there? Could you tell us? Because we don't. Well, um, it's a hard question. It did. And uh, uh, Merkel clearly like was a strong leader, like with a with strong understanding of how politics work like she was reelected uh, three times like she had uh, she stayed four times in office she she was pretty good in the first two terms um did she was like russian agent or something were they here in ukraine i think of course not she was not did she acted in um several cases in interests of russia yes she did uh, did she do it um, intentionally? I don't know. Like her worst decision was to push the blockade of the uh, NATO membership of Georgia and Ukraine in 28. And that was one of real crazy things because she said we may not have countries in, uh, in, uh, in NATO which have undissolved uh, territorial disputes. And Georgia didn't have that uh, problem with uh, Ossetia and Abkhazia back then in that in that scale, but that was like a practically like an open open letter to Putin. Invitation. Hey, guy, you know what to do to stop the countries to prevent them from entering NATO. Just organize a small uh, a small like border border conflict, and you'll be fine. And she did it like in early, early 2008, in August 2008, Georgia was uh, attacked by Russia. 
And uh, like five years later, uh, Ukraine was attacked by Russia too. So both countries were utterly in this way of thinking, were utterly prevented from entering NATO in any way. And then like um, there was another thing uh, with uh, with uh, the the with the Nord Stream too. Sorry, and, and I want to just leave one comment. The the ironic part is that Germany was actually uh, became a NATO member when part of her territories were not like not That's hers. True. Not That's only true. Uh, as Germany as Germany joined NATO, Germany was in state of war in the legal state of war with the Soviet Union. Like no. Oh. I didn't know. Yeah, because the state of war ended uh, uh, in autumn 55 after the Adnor visit to Moscow. Before um, later 55, uh, there was only ceasefire. And uh, when, we, when we look at uh, the, another Merkel's decision, uh, like to uh, green light Nord Stream 2, like uh, we, we gladly blame Gerhard Schroeder for being like uh, Putin's bootlicker. And um, that is always my argument when I'm been told that Ukraine is so corrupt. I ask, yeah, uh, I, I missed the, 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 the I missed the story. Like, was the Gerhard Schroeder Ukrainian chancellor? Like, never heard that. Or was like, uh, you know, was he indicted? Franz of Young, uh, was he a uh, Ukrainian foreign minister? Or was maybe Frau Kneisse not an Austrian but a Ukrainian politician? Because they were all like uh, searched their job, their next job in Russia, and I didn't hear it that that the Ukrainian politicians uh, usually applied for that job. Um, we only only the worst ones, only the most <laughs> Russian and very obvious guys get their jobs in uh, on like Russian state TV. Like you know, we have Ilaki, and we have our. Ex president actually live in Russia now, but yeah, but no, he, 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 he's a pension. Don't he's get a, a job pensioner in, in Russia. Like he's a he's a yeah, ballast yeah. for the Russian budget, not an asset. Um, <laughs> no, not so. An asset, no. Another another decision is like uh, Angela Merkel's Nord Stream two because Gerhard Schröder was responsible for Nord Stream one, but Angela Merkel was totally responsible for Nord Stream two. And it was against all the uh, ideas of the German economy and politics about what is uh, energy independency or energy security mean. Uh, because we, we decided for us that uh, we never buy more than 20% of natural gas from uh, any, any country because it makes this country too important for us. And natural gas indeed is an important not only energy source but also important chemical, chemical uh, resource for our industry. And under the Merkel's rule, Germany's dependency on the Russian natural gas uh, jumped uh, for over 40%, which allowed Putin to use this leverage uh, in summer 20, in summer 21 and in winter 21, 22, when the prices like skyrocketed. And do you know what? Like in the German politician, it was always in the German policy, it was always the idea of Utterly false idea that we cannot get out of this dependency, uh, so we, we need Russia for that. And the new government under the for, under the economy minister Habeck, who is also deputy chancellor in Germany, and who was actually the first German politician who openly called for delivering lethal weapons to Ukraine in uh, in June twenty one or in May twenty one. I was a head of Heinrich Böll Foundation in Kiev back then, and. Uh, I uh, accompanied uh, Robert Halleck on his visit, and uh, it was uh, his first visit, and it was my honor to like introduce him into uh, the Ukraine history and the history of Russia-Ukraine war, which is my, way more longer war than like five years or eight years or twenty or thirty years. And I'm really proud that uh, the next day he said that uh, Ukraine needs to get like lethal weapons. So he, this Robert Halleck, released. Germany from the gas dependency of Russia, and now we don't buy any gas from Russia, and the gas price they on our market like one are lower than before the pandemic. That is amazing. So we buy all gas from Norway, from the Netherlands, from the U.S. But this was the the uh, like the boogeyman of the Germans. Like, oh, we may not be dependent of America. American fracking gas is so bad, so bad. 
we buy good, clean Russian gas because Russia, Russia is our neighbor. And America, it's capitalism, it's war, it's Iraq. Do you know what the Americans did in Iraq? Uh, they were very bad. And Trump, etc. Like so that. that was some, some psychotic, schizophrenic, uh, anti-Americanism. Uh, seasoned with uh, Russia, Russia, Russophily and uh, Russia dependency. And that led Germany into that debacle uh, where we found ourselves in early 2022. I want to end with something good and positive, and I'm not sure if you can deliver that. Uh, but do, th do we think that things have changed and we are like, uh, in, not we, Germany, uh, move, but we are also because we are dependent but germany moves into other direction right now that the the past times the times of not understanding russia uh have like and not understanding eastern europe has gone and now we are like germany is like a new have new politics new um uh, ideology in that sense i would say we are uh i would say yes uh we are indeed in the new world uh, look, we have a totally new uh, level of support for Ukraine amid the German population. I see it all the time when my company starts uh, charity campaigns collecting money for drones or for other equipment for the Ukrainian army. We get a lot of donations from Germany. Small donations, big donations from every single social level, like donations from 5 euro to 2,000 euro up to 5,000 euro. That is amazing. Uh, many people uh, comment from Germany, oh, I'm so sorry, I donate so, so little sum, like uh, so less money, I would have uh, donated more, but I cannot. You know, like people donate money for the Ukrainian army to help Ukrainians to push back the Russian invasion. And they are sorry that they don't donate more. Now that's... And that is what That's you see in Germany. Uh, of course, there is a lot of idealism towards Russia. Of course, there is a little of idealism towards how can you achieve peace. And if you look at the polls, you will see sometimes answers are really weird. But we are, of course, we are living now in a totally different world where you can openly talk in Germany about like, how can you provide arms to Ukraine to kill the Russian soldiers who invaded Ukraine? And nobody questioned that. Nobody questioned the right of Ukraine for self-defense. It may sound weird for the Ukrainians or for the Americans, but one year ago, many Germans questioned the very right of the Ukrainians for yeah. self-defense. And now there is no sign of that. And I think uh, that the Ukrainian victory will create the next option, the next level of this change. Because when we look at the German like public opinion, as soon as Ukraine uh, created facts on the ground, like liberation, like Kharkiv offensive. Uh, key, first Kiev was defended, then Kharkiv offensive, then Kherson liberation. Every time the support for Ukraine raised and understanding that Ukraine is not some sort of failed state, corrupt state, don't send them weapons, they will sell them on the black market, blah, blah, blah. Uh, it disappeared. And Germans look at Ukraine and understand that these people are amazing. And we can have like our problems with certain parties, with certain politicians, with certain like uh, shitheads who like uh, tell all the stories about how wonderful it is for Ukrainians to, to surrender to the Russians because then they will get peace, like in Bucha and Irpin, obviously. Uh, but they are minority. They are marginal minority. And the most of the Germans support the Ukrainians in their fight. And this is, I believe, the biggest change and this is how I would say the Ukrainians provided us Germans with some sort of a lesson, of a historical lesson, and helped us to find our way for the next decades in the world which is not getting safer, but requires from us to be much more resilient, active, and be ready to defend our freedoms and our liberties. Yeah. Thank you very I much. I think it's a great ending. Yeah, yeah thank that, you that, very that much. That was perfect. Yeah. Thank you very much. That, uh, thank you for coming. Thank you so much. It was amazing to speak to you.